Hello and welcome to He's Dropping at the Movies. I'm Mike. And I'm Jose. And we've just seen Suzaki Paradise Akashingo, or uh, Ak- Akashingo in English is Red Light District. Yes. This is a, a 1956 Japanese film directed by Yuzo Kawashima. Yes. You suggested this. Yes. It's about a young couple who are down to their last 60 pence, or whatever the equivalent of pence yen. is in yen, <laughs> and they take a bus to... Well, I think pretty much anywhere. They wind up outside this place, Suzaki, mm. which is the red light district. Yes. Um, I think this was around the time... I think the film was released around the time the prostitution laws came in. The film itself tells us that there's going to be new prostitution laws being introduced. Yeah. They wind up just outside the district. And there's this whole thing about the bridge that leads to the district. And it's this kind of ever-present about once you cross the bridge... Things are lost. There's a kind of mythical aspect to the red light district. Yes. That although you never actually quite go there, people go there, they don't come back, or hearts are lost there and things like that, and people have histories there, there's pain associated with it. And it's a film about two people who are down on their luck and trying to get by, and the kind of misadventures that follow them, I guess. Mm. From what I understand, Karashima was known for sort of satires and comedies, and this doesn't quite fit into that. This is more of a drama. Well, actually... That's not my experience of him. I mean, so I really wanted Mike to see this film because about a year ago, maybe, a movie had a retrospective of his films or a selection of his films, rather. Mm. Uh, and I was just so caught up in them. I loved them so much that actually I kind of, you know, I did this thing where I, I tried the different movie releases in Spain and the US to try to catch up with the cycle that they had shown because I came late to the cycle in the UK, and then of course I ordered uh, more of his films from Singapore, I think, and of course they arrived just as the first lockdown was beginning. So actually, I didn't receive them, yeah, until oh, right. you know months later. And I just kind of love Kaoshima. It's been a, a discovery for me, but it's not because he's a sat. It's a satire. It's because they're almost all noir melodramas of a, a society in the process of change. All his films. Mm. are a change. You know, Japan is changing yeah, in the 1950s. There's a way of life that's being left behind. Yeah, mm. and, and modernity's coming in. And it's all about kind of relationships within, within, between people, you know, but not people who have the same place in that culture. There's always like power imbalances. Mm. But the power imbalances is not how you think necessarily, right? So in this film, for example... You're not told, and that's the other thing, yeah, that the films resonate, yeah, and they're really visually quite beautiful to watch, I think, and they're very poetic. I mean, kind of, you know, what you were saying about the bridge and what it symbolizes, yeah, Mm. and so on. But it also kind of resonates with information that is given to you indirectly, right? So, you know, eventually as the film unfolds, you realize that the heroine is a former prostitute, yeah, that kind Mm -hmm. of people recognize her, right? You know, that the pimp, in quotation marks, is really kind of, you know, a respectable office worker who she's kind of driven to this degradation. (laughs) Mm. Uh, And, you know, he's completely besotted for her and he sees himself as a loser and a failure because he can't give her what, you know, what Mm. what she wants. Right. But on the on the other hand, she's dragged him down into this underworld. Yeah. uh, Where he's in in the position uh, that he is. Um, the mm-hmm. other thing that I love about uh, uh, Kaoshima is that the characters are all three-dimensional. Everybody has it, their reasons, and you know what they are. Mm. Yeah. So you know, in the, in the, here, for example, you know the woman really has dragged this man down, but on the other hand, she does have feelings for him. Yeah. She kind of, you know, she does care about him. Uh, also, you know, you get the feeling that she's got her own problems yeah, and kind mm-hmm. of. You know, that she's not fundamentally a bad person. Yeah, she's, you know, she's somebody who brings gifts to the children and mm. yeah, all of these things that she's not meant to. So the characters are always like that. Yeah, they're always imperfect. Yeah, but they're never evil. Or, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's what I love about him. Yeah. It wasn't a feeling that I got that she had dragged him down. Exactly. Although, you know, initially she's the one who gets on this bus and he chases after her and the bus winds up just outside this red light district and she's the one who's much more comfortable trying to make money for herself trying to find a job so she immediately manages to get work at this bar slinging sake 
to sort of lonely guys and then playing the part of a flirt, you know, getting them to spend more and more money and so on. And her partner's, you know, kind of following, basically, and Phil, and obviously he's a bit lost. He's looking for some, he's someone who's looking for his place in life, I think. But he is um, a kind of a bit of a loser, I think. Um, maybe that's uncharitable, but, like, he's constructed as, as a bit of a... Well, he's a follower, he's a layabout, he's a bit of a slob early on. He takes the job that is found for him pretty much immediately, but he he's, he doesn't go out of his way to look for things, try and find things. Yes. And actually, at the end of the film, when they wind up back at the first bridge, which is not the Red Light District Bridge, the bridge that they started at before they got on the bus, and she says, you go first this time. You know, this sense of, okay, we've tried my way, <laughs> now we'll try yours. Um, you kind of think, I, I kind of thought, this is a guy who is so directionless. Where would they possibly end up? Why would she want to follow him? Well, you see, I've, I, my reading is different. Hmm. It changed in the process of viewing, yeah, because you know you are immediately uh, uh, all you see is this guy who is useless. Yeah, she's got to take charge. She's got to decide. She finds them work and a place to stay and food. Right, so you know they begin on the bridge, kind of contemplating suicide. They've got nowhere to go. Sixty yen left, and you know he's just depressed and hopeless, mm. right? Um, but then as the film unfolds, you realize that I mean he's somebody who comes from a middle class life, who's had an office job, mm. yeah, who who doesn't know how to deal with any of this, right? With any of this uncertainty, where she's very experienced, she knows exactly what to do. Yeah, yeah, she knows how to get a bed for the night and yeah, how to get food and and so on. Yeah, and actually the process at the end, you see, is which I thought was really interesting because actually, rather than the film being about her process of change, it's actually about his. Yeah, so yeah. you know, kind of what you've seen in a way is him spiraling kind of downwards and then him accepting that life that mm-hmm. underworld life yeah he's chosen her yeah he's going to be her pimp or, or whatever right mm-hmm. and then yeah he take he does take direction at the end yeah so there's a, a yeah a process yeah. of change in that right um and i think it's very interesting because in a way and this is where the class things figure because everybody talks about you know he's taken the lowest of the lowest of the jobs yeah he's a a soba delivery boy right yeah, delivery noodles yeah and so, you know, they say, oh, you, you know, you have a, a strong looking man like you, you could at least work in construction or mm. something, right? But, you know, he's, he's an educated person who's come from an office job, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, and actually that's pointed out because the clothes don't fit the job, yeah? Like, mm. you know, so, so actually this process of being good has also been one of degradation, yeah? Mm. You know, of losing face, of going lower and lower down the social stratum, yeah, for him. Yeah, you know, all because of his love for her. He's left his job for her. They've run off. They come from different cities. Mm. Yeah, they've ended up in the metropolis. And where do they end up? Uh, you know, on the bridge. Yeah, towards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. On the kind of liminal space. Exactly. And actually, it's one that she knows well because she's already been in those brothels. Yeah. Right. So in a way, he's her way out, right? Or he's been her way out, right? Mm. But actually, she's his way down. Yeah. Right. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. And the film is full of resonances, really, and and it's so it's both very sympathetic, you know, but also uh, clear-eyed. Yeah. You know, men have the power, and men are the problem. And even when you have children, you you know, men leave. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, or or men go see other women. Yeah. Or well, exactly. The 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 bar owner's husband has been seduced by his own concubine from yes. across the bridge. For the last four years, that's right. And she's raising the two kids on her own. Yes, but this doesn't mean in Kawashima's world that love doesn't exist. I mean, it's not all just about sex, right? Like mm. you know, the young man who's in love with this girl and who's basically buying her every night so that she, yeah, she doesn't sleep with other men. Mm. I mean, you know, he recognizes that bo- there's both kind of that life is complex and there are feelings that are real and then things that are manipulated. Yeah, and there are power relations. I mean, mm. and you see all of this in Kawashima in an eighty-minute melodrama. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's funny what you're saying about um, about the 
men because it struck me that struck me that patriarchy was an interest of the film more so than class, although maybe they're related. But the central couple, I think, are both victims of it. I think he's a victim of it in that the kind of societal expectations of what a man should be he doesn't meet and he feels that innately. Yes. Um, but but also rather than kind of working hard to be a man at least at the start he just kind of shrivels and mopes and doesn't do anything he just feels depressed to himself well actually Um, he he ends up doing much more than he should because you know if you remember he gets a job in this place he's only worked for two days and on his second day she comes in asking for a kimono (laughs) you know and money and all and he does steal it for her you know so so and on her side she, you know, as you say, she's much more self-possessed and knows how to get along and stuff, but her entire, the, the way in which she gets along is by attaching herself to men. Yes. She and plays find, them. Yeah, and, and kind of, and the th- I think there's a feeling of, like, finding the right man to attach yourself to. I didn't actually see it coming that they would end up back together again at the end of the film. I thought she would, you know, there's that kind of transactional relationship she has with the guy who's paying for everything, and I kind of thought that's where she's sort of destined to end up. Yeah, I don't know, because in a way you feel um, it's difficult to judge because she doesn't have much else. So, I mean, basically, she's using her sex appeal, you know, to basically get by, right? Like, so initially her flirting with the customers, just a way of getting customers in, of getting them to drink, Mm -hmm. yeah, and so on, right? Uh, But then, of course, you know, kind of another opportunity kind of opens up. And she says, I've got nothing, you know, I've got nothing to lose. I can go right now. You know, mm. I have no, yeah, kind of the things I own are so minimal. You can keep them. You know, and yeah. she just runs off. So I found that whole thing kind of so interesting. And it's, it's very interesting structurally if you compare each of them, right? So of the women, we see a very nice young girl also at the end of the film on the Suzuki Bridge but, you know, but she's good and she's hardworking and, you know, she also falls in love with the guy. So, and she's young. So, you know, there's her. Uh, there's the a bar owner, middle-aged, who's been left by her husband and is bringing up two kids on her own. Yeah. Uh, there's the woman who used to be a prostitute, who is the central character mm-hmm. in the film. Uh, there's uh, the woman who murders the bar owner's wife, uh, husband, because he left her. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's an old prostitute who's used up, and there's a young girl who basically repeats the same story that our heroine—I forget what her name is—has just lived. Is it Sutai? Sutai, yeah. So all of these women, the good ones in quotation marks, are are all well. They're all the victims of men. Mm. Yeah, and actually, the film is brutally frank, right? Like. Uh, you know, about men both buying the women, yeah, in the brothel, but also the women are sold off, yeah, into mm. the brothel or, you know, or from this brothel onto that brothel, right? Mm. You know, so it's kind of one in which, you know, they have very limited options, yeah, and kind mm. of survival is key. And, you know, using sex is one of the ways that people survive, yeah. So I don't think the film judges them for that. No, no, I don't think it judges them. I, I think it, I think it shows them to be victims, and I think, um, I, I think men are, are shown to be victims of of the patriarchy and of the red light district. Also, it's less vicious, perhaps. Although one of the men is murdered by <laughs> by a yes. woman from there, but I, I was really struck by the scene where the guy has lost the love of his life to the red light district, and yes. he's completely broken by that. Yes. he's coming back across the bridge, and she's she's gone. Yeah. Um, She's been sold off. Yeah. Um, is it a film that's um, like prudish? No, the opposite. Um, I mean, actually, I was thinking that can you you can't imagine this film being being made even in the US in 1956, even though already the censorship norms were changing. Mm. Yeah, a film that is so frank about sex, about sex as transaction, you know, about desire, about love. Yeah, but in which sex is just so frank. Right, like, I mean, it's hard to... I, I yeah, it. but it always results in pain. Yeah, everything that's associated with that red light district is associated with pain here, and it seems to bring pain to everyone. I think, though, that for uh, Kawashima, mm. life is sad. 
<laughs> you know, so like life is pain. I mean, it's full of pleasures and beauty and so on, but it is also pain. You know, actually, I loved watching his films because, you know, each of his films is about a kind of a social problem. Yeah. Uh, in in this changing society. So it's about, you know, some of them are about overpopulation or, you know, some of them are about kind of the corporate world or. Yeah. yeah? But they're all melodramas about, you know, kind of a social issue in relation to people in the process of change. And this is clearly about prostitution, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's sure. Kind of, you know, about kind of that underworld. Um, but, you know, it suggests other things. I mean, so, for example, very much is made of just uh, the bike, the motorbike, you know, that one of the guys rides mm. and how expensive and sleek and beautiful it is. Yeah, and the thing about radios, yeah, mm. and, you know, kind of all of that, that that symbolizes, right? Um, and yet, you know, kind of samurai swords floating on the river, yeah, on this dirty, dirty river. Yeah, mm. it's kind of, yeah, uh, and and you're told that it's yeah that everything is changing, that there are prostitution laws coming out, that you know this world is about to disappear or be displaced into something else, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, or go underground somewhere or whatever. Yeah, but that that it's changing, yeah, that new mm. laws are coming. Uh, so, um, yeah, I kind of I find it very beautiful because. Also, almost each character and each setting is like a symbol or, or is the tip of the iceberg of a world that is somewhat legible, right? So for example, if you just take the bar owner, the woman you know, whose husband has left her, mm -hmm. kind of they show you her house, they show you the children, they show you somebody who gets by out of renting boats on the, yeah, and out of, yeah, mm -hmm. selling whatever she can. Of course, she lives in a tiny space, yeah, what is it, it's two rooms, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So she's raising children, kind of working extremely hard, being a good neighbor, yeah, and being helpful and so on. The children are exposed to this world of the bridges, yeah, and nonetheless they're going to school. She's worried about how they do their homework, how they're clean. Yeah, mm -hmm. you have this thing of like the children washing their hands kind of on the way you know, to the room at the back. I mean, there's a whole way of life that's kind of evoked in just that one character and that one bit of the film. I mean, it's, I think it's really beautiful. She always seems to know what's going on with the with the main couple as well. To me, she she always seems to be standing behind them when they're talking or 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 when they're not together. But you see the girl, you know, chatting up some guy at the bar. You see the guy watching, and then she's there, and she always, she always seems to have a look, almost a camera, mm. like, like 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 you know, Laurel and Hardy, and just going like, look at these people. Mm. I know them. I understand these people. I love her face. Mm. Yeah. Uh, she's she's middle aged. She's got a round face. It's really very expressive. Yeah, you you see things going on. But she's seen it before. You know, she's. I mean, at the start when when they go to the bar and, and um, the girls asking for work, she says, "Oh, girls, just use this place as a stepping stone. Basically, yes. you'll be the same as them and stuff." And yeah. then by the end, when they've come and gone, and she's talking to the guy who's spent all this money on her. <laughs> No. He go, you know, he kind of goes, oh well, you know, hundred thousand yen, that's what it is. Yeah. And she goes, yep, yeah, there she goes. And yes. <laughs> it's just like it's, it's just for them, it's just they pass through. Yes, and actually, you see it again because everything in the film is cyclical. So at the very end of the film, another young girl comes in, mm -hmm. yeah, asking for a job, exactly the same, flirting right? with the guy when the job doesn't come. Exactly, <laughs> right. So the film is about social processes and social change as much as it is about these individual characters. Yeah? Mm. Um, and I think, you know, and this is one of the things that I love about uh, uh, Kaoshima because, you know, it's an 80 minute melodrama and yet it contains and it evokes so much. Yeah. Mm. And I really kind of, uh, um, I really feel for the people. I mean, in this case, the person I feel most for is that bar owner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, that that middle aged woman, um, though, you know, clearly it's the young couple that are meant to be the central yeah. kind of couple. And they're less sympathetic, uh, which I kind of like as well. Yeah? yeah, you know, because it would have been very easy to sentimentalize that prostitute. Mm -hmm. But no, you know, she's kind of, she's out for herself and, you know, she does have feelings and she is kind of good and so on. But also she can be cruel and harsh and self-involved. Yeah, mm -hmm. And the guy, you know, he's very attractive and so on, but actually, and her situation is understandable, but really snap out of it right <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, yeah you know 
though it's an interesting performance because it is somebody who is depressed throughout the film yeah yeah it's kind of you can see it in his movement he's like everything is just too much for him he can't cope yeah you know so I think that's a very interesting and unusual kind of central couple in a film as well both not quite sympathetic yeah but interestingly I think as well as avoiding sentimentalizing um, the couple on the other hand it also avoids dwelling in you know what could be a really really like pornographic look at the horrible conditions in which they live yes. you know, think another film might have done that another film might have you know been like poverty porn I guess yes. and it doesn't yes. do that at all either yes. it actually it, there's, a, there's a balancing act in yes. the tone yes. that I think is really successful oh, good so um, what what did you think I mean overall um, of Japanese films of this era that I've seen which isn't many none has really ever grabbed me and I, I do find something sterile about them um, which is not a word uh, that you will enjoy um, no because you know I think Ozu is like the greatest filmmaker ever yeah um, there's something about them that doesn't that I don't connect with really you know, I remember the one I was supposed to be absolutely blown away by when I saw um, Ikiru um, by Kurosawa, and I, I felt lost, really. But, you know, I, I mean, it's not it's no, it's no blame of the film. Like, it's, it's I maybe need to give them another go, or need to try and see them differently, or understand the context better, and that sort of thing. I do feel disconnected from them. And this, in some respects, I did feel that similar sense of disconnection. But I got the characters, and I got the situation that they were in. And it kind of got its hooks into me as a melodrama in that sense of what's mm. going to happen next and where these characters are going to end up and that sort of thing, um, which I quite enjoyed. I enjoyed the way it sets up this thing about the red light district that's across the way that you never actually quite get to. You're just outside and it's this kind of looming mm. um, sort of sort of potential dark place that people just go into or emerge from. Mm. That, I think, is... Really interesting and quite evocative. Yes, because it's not just a dark place, right? I mean, and that's the way in which it's gendered, right? Mm. Most of the men come out of there feeling thrilled. Yeah, they've <laughs> had a great time. They've lost all their money, but, you know, they're... they're yeah, let me say, yeah but they, I don't think the film return. feels happy about that, though. There's something... It's a bittersweet... What's that Japanese phrase? Is it um, mono no awake? Is that I it? I don't know. It's a Japanese phrase that means... That it, it, it's about... Um, it's about things having feelings and a kind of bittersweet appreciation of the beauty in something fleeting and a, and the kind of you know the bittersweet aspect is that like you appreciate it and also you feel that it's going to go and that well, sort of thing yeah. and there's something about that in in this it's like it's a, a feeling of of moments um and you know, in the way that the, in the way that men emerge from the red light district, having got their rocks off and had a fantastic time, is fleeting. And there's a sense of like the, they don't have connection with another person. That well, that is true. You know, that is true. But I think what I meant to say is that generally it's gendered, right? So that when you see the men coming out of there, they've often lost their money or whatever. Yeah, but they've got the power and they have a good time, and they're often pushing women out of the way so they can get inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, to what they see as the real fun. Whereas for women, you cross that line and you're lost, you're dead, you're, uh, yeah, that's it for you. Yeah. And which is why it's so interesting that as the film progresses, you realize that the heroine is someone who's come back from that. Yeah. Yeah, who's kind of, you know, uh, and you, and, and there, there's also the old process who says she tried once, you know, to go and live an honest life and then just couldn't do it and returned, yeah? So mm. now she's old and broken down and, you know, competing with girls much younger than her. But she doesn't see a way out, you know? She still prefers that world to, to what she lived outside. So I think it's a film that just resonates, yeah, that has all of these little things that uh, resonate. And I think in that sense, it's very beautiful, I mean, I don't think it's one of the greatest films of all time. I, I don't think it's, you know, in any way comparable to Ozu and Tokyo Story or anything like that, you know. How would you compare it to other Japanese films of the of the era? Well, they're all different and, you know, uh, it, it's something that I'd like to explore more. So, you know, I, I love Ozu unconditionally, you know. I think with Kurosawa, 
I actually like his noirs and melodramas more than I like his epics. Mm -hmm. You know, and actually you see five minutes of a Kurosawa film of that period and you think, that's a master filmmaker. I mean, you know, just the way that he structures the shots, really. Mm. You know, um, and I'd like to explore that kind of more thoroughly. I've often, uh, I've seen things like I went through a box set of Imamura films, you know, and that was a discovery uh, for me. Of more recent filmmakers, yeah, I kind of, I think I went through Kitano almost systematically, mm -hmm. you know, with an with an increased appreciation of that pulp uh, aspect of his work. Um, but you know, that's it. I mean, I don't I don't know Japanese cinema yeah. at all. I just know these particular filmmakers because for some reason or another, they've been brought to my attention. As you know, has Kawashima just because it happened to be playing on movie. Yeah. So as you're saying, Kawashima, you feel. You hadn't heard of, it was underrepresented, it's not named in the same breath as Ozu and Kurosawa yeah. and so on. And it's and clearly commercial filmmaking and so on, but I think it's absolutely great. I love it. And it's interesting that he died at the age of 45. That's right. And made something like 50 films in a 20 year career. Amazing. Which is madness. I know. And that's why, like, so they all feel like melodramas, pulpy. They're often very beautiful, like, you know, some of the shot compositions and so on. I mean, you know, there's one of them, uh, which I now forget their name, but it's set in a nightclub, right? And often it has a glass ceiling, right? So you're often seeing kind of what's happening on the floor above through the floor below in the glass. Mm. I mean, it's just incredibly striking looking you know, films uh, or films with, you know, very striking kind of shots. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's been a discovery. So shall we wrap it up? Mm. All right. So. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs> we are eavesdropping at the movies and we are on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud and YouTube. On social media, we're on Facebook and Twitter and mm. the website is eavesdroppingatthemovies.com. Thank you very much. Sayonara. Sayonara.